Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading, and today we're going to start the build process on this Invest Arms Gimmer Hawken. Now, I've been teasing this kit for a little while now, but I'm happy to say that we finally have some time to spend on it here in the shop, and I'm excited to crack it open today, do an in depth overview of the parts, the instructions, what comes with it, and then as we move forward with the series, we'll talk about the tools that you'll need or the tools that I recommend to put a kit like this together, and we'll go through the entire build process so that you can follow along or use it as research if you're looking to get into a muzzleloading kit like this kit from Invest Arms. Kits have been a little hard to find this year. I'd like to thank muzzleloaders.com for getting me this kit in to build for this video. Full disclosure, I did receive a discount on the kit that we're using in this video, but all of the comments and critiques I have about the kit and the build process are totally my own. It's totally kind of my raw impressions of this kit as we go along. In a previous video that I did, kind of getting my first impressions of this kit as we open it up, I mentioned that there weren't any instructions in the box and I'm happy to say that there are instructions for this kit. You can find them on the listing page for muzzleloaders.com if you order from muzzleloaders.com or wherever you get your kit from. They should have a PDF copy of these instructions so you can go through and follow along as you're building. This one comes out to just about nine pages and I put it on front and back so it's only using about five pieces of paper. I thought about just putting this on my phone or my iPad here in the shop, but a lot of the times when you're building something like this, it's really nice to have the paper instructions that you can hold on to and uh, you don't mind them getting dirty or, or stained or glued or anything, you know, depending on what you're doing with your kit. So I really recommend printing off the instructions. It's gonna help you in the long run. And before you start building, I'm gonna talk about this quite a bit with this kind of kit building process um, that a lot of people go through and that I myself go through is I like to pre-plan a lot of this. Even though it's a kit, I find that reviewing the instructions, you know, the night before you start and each day before you go back in kind of helps you keep a fresh mind about what you're doing. And you can kind of think through the process that you're going through. That way you're not making mistakes, ideally, or you're not rushing into things without too much of a thought process. I think it really helps to plan a lot of this stuff regardless of the complexity of the kit that you're working with. So let's open up the box and see what these parts look like. Right off the bat, I'm a big fan of the box design. I know it's a little thing, but I like the modern font and the modern colors. You can see right here, we have a one in 60 twist barrel, a 32 inch blued barrel here. So this one in 60 twist is interesting. A lot of these contemporary kits will be a one in 48 twist to try to accommodate lead round balls or a conical of some sort for you know modern hunting sportsmen, you know looking to extend a season or get into muzzleloader hunting seasons. Um, and seeing this in the in the 1 and 60 twist is kind of nice. It's a little bit more of a traditional twist like you'd see in other long rifles that are out there. We open it up. Here we have our instruction manual for muzzleloading rifles, pistols, and shotguns. This is just going to give us an overview of general use of muzzleloaders. And on top here, we have a nice diagram. Almost looks hand-drawn here of all the different parts and pieces. I don't use this a whole lot. I'll kind of set this aside as a point of reference, but I always like to hang these up here in the shop once I'm done with the project. I love these illustrations of, and schematics, I guess is probably what they really are is what you'd call it. Um, I love these and just taking a look at them. This design here is for the cap lock. So if you have the cap lock version, um, the schematics there, but if you have the flint lock version, like we're gonna be building here, you have that in the diagram here in the lower corner. So we're gonna set both of those aside. You really wanna keep track of these uh, because you'll find a point where they become very useful. So I'm just setting those to the side with my instructions. Unlike some of the other kits that you'll find out there, this is packaged a little bit differently. Everything's in cardboard and in these plastic bags. It's not in a plastic, hard plastic bubble wrap that I think is a little more susceptible to dings and things. This is a little more soft padding, which I appreciate. I'm gonna open up I guess the primary bag here being the stock with some other pieces here. Set that aside. And this here is the main section of our muzzleloader that we're gonna be building. You can see here the stock has been roughly shaped. All the inlets though look to be complete. Now we might have to do a little bit of work I think famously on these kits, of, of all these kind of Hawking kits, the trigger guards need a little bit of, of, of work, but we can do that. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Looks like the trigger's already inlet. Our nose cap and our entry pipe is already set in here. 
our inlet here for our lock plate screw is already in there as well as our barrel tenon plates already set here. So a lot of the hard work is done, which is what I like about these kits. We can just kind of go along with the build process, kind of like I, I call it a mountain man Lego set. A lot of the inlet and things, are they're good to know, and I think we're going to talk about that down the road on the channel. But getting started in muzzle loading or just getting started in kit building, having all the inlets done that you know they're right is a nice place to start. Here you can see our butt plate is already attached. Now we will take this off and on quite a bit as we work on this piece, but it's nice. This is already kind of centered here with the barrel tang as it goes back. So we'll be removing a lot of wood on this kit. I think that's gonna be the name of the game on this Invest Arms kit is wood removal, but I'm okay with that. I don't mind wood removal. It's the inlets I think that get a little hairy for a lot of folks, especially if you haven't spent a lot of time building muzzleloaders and, uh, and just woodworking in general. Something I'm a little nervous about here on this lock plate, you can see the lock plate has already been uh, hard, case hardened or, or blued, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's apt, it's technically case hardened, but we have that kind of look of it being case hardened here. We're gonna be removing some wood around this lock plate to make this a little bit more even. And we're gonna to wanna to pay attention to this because we don't wanna remove this finish or make it otherwise uneven as we do so. So we're gonna be careful as we work on this lock mortise around this area. You can see here around the wrist, there's a lot of rough wood. We're gonna have a lot of fun taking that down probably going to blend a lot of coming off of this cheek rest into this area of the wrist here, kind of blending this area, getting rid of these bumps and things. I'm a big fan of the cast iron hardware on this. Even here on this entry pipe, there's some room for us to get a little fancy with our file work, which I'm excited about. A lot of times people feel that these kits are restrictive to the kind of creative process. But I think if you know what you're getting into, and, and again, you kind of think about the process, you can plan to add some of your own builder flair or assembler flair to the piece. I'm a sucker for iron mounted muzzle loaders anyway, and kind of a stout iron mounted flintlock Hawken was definitely on my list of something to assemble here. And, uh, and it looks like this kit's gonna deliver for us. So I'm gonna set that aside over here. Here's our barrel tang that will hook to the breech end of our barrel. Got a pretty steep curve in there. Nothing too special about this. You know, it's, uh, it's another part. And here's our trigger guard, again, in this kind of cast iron. Uh, right now you'll see that it's kind of rough and we can see this casting gate here, which is what this circle here is called and we'll be removing that but that is left over from when they cast all of these so the molten iron would flow in through a column basically that size through the mold to fill out the mold to make this trigger guard now depending on how you want this piece to look in the end you could leave it like this and let it age in naturally but traditionally this would be cleaned up quite a bit and made to look a little bit nicer and then aged over time and we'll be talking about that down the road. I just, I like that shape. It's just a nice, it's a simple shape, but it really, it really works well for me. Setting that aside here through some of this cardboard. So here's our ramrod and our ramrod pipes attached to our barrel rib. Now I'm not sure if we, yeah, there we go. Get that out. Ooh, so that's nice. It's going to take a little investigating here. I'm curious how they attached these ramrod pipes to the barrel rib, but they're definitely more secure than some of the kits you see with a screw coming in from the underside or the top side of the barrel rib into the thimble. And here we have a nice ramrod retention spring here on the rib to help our ramrod stay in place. That's a nice little touch. And again, just like our entry pipes, these thimbles are pretty plain. We can leave them plain or we can do some file work on them down the road to add a little bit of character to the hardware on this kit. Really heavy, really dense barrel rib here. I'm, I'm really pleased so far with the weight of these, uh, of these parts. I mean, they could just have a bunch of lead in the center cast around the iron, but I, I'm just goofing there. I don't think that's the case. It's just a nice, uh, nice dense piece of hardware. And I know it's simple, but um, it's nice to see a nice wooden ramrod included with this kit. Some of the cheaper kits out there will be a, uh, a fiberglass or a plastic ramrod. And that you just can't beat the feel in your hands of a wood ramrod like this. It's already got the ramrod tips attached. So here we have a threaded end where we can screw in our jags and other different ramrod tools. And on this end, we have 
a loading end. Now this end doesn't have any threads in it, but it is concaved there to go around our round ball as we load. Really pleased with the wooden ramrod on that. Barrel's the next obvious piece here. And here is our big, chunky Hawken barrel. I've been playing a lot with uh, pistols and long rifles here lately, and getting back into the Hawkins, I'm just kind of caught with the heavy, dense barrel that we have here. It's a pretty short barrel, I think, again, at that 32 inches, but you can see that barrel wall there. That's nice and thick. It's nice and heavy, and on these shorter barrels, that'll help us balance as we're holding and shooting. You can see our rear sight dovetails already cut in, our front sight dovetails already cut in as well. And our barrel lugs here, I think are interesting. We don't have to tap these in with a dovetail. Now this is kind of hidden in the stock, so we don't have to worry about necessarily period accuracy here. And they've been kind of welded or otherwise attached to the underside of the barrel there, looking like a really stable way to attach this barrel to the wedges and to the stock. Um, that's a that's a neat little modern touch on these. I always like seeing how co temporary companies put together these kits and, and try to make them affordable and, and easy to assemble for people while still meshing old and new manufacturing techniques. And that's one for sure right there. <laughs> here at the breech end, you can see we have our little hook breech here, just like uh, just about all of the Hawken kits that you'll see in the modern era here, the kind of hooked into the to the tang here, kind of show you that here. And that's what holds the breech end of the rifle into the stock. We'll have two screws here going into the stock. That captures the barrel there, and then we'll put in our wedges, and that'll pretty much attach this to the stock for a nice secure hold. Here you can see our touch hole hole. This is where we'll put our touch hole liner here a little bit later as we continue the build. And overall, the finish on this barrel isn't too bad. A lot of times you'll see a pretty rough finish. I do still feel like I see some mill marks in here. So we're going to go through and sand or file this barrel a little bit just to get a nice even surface before we do our final treatment on there. On all of these modern or contemporary Hawken kits or really any traditional muzzleloader kit that you can buy in 2021, you're going to see a lot of this marking here on the breech end, primarily for safety, so that you have all the indications here, you know, black powder only. That's the big one, and uh, the big reason why we have these markings on here, to prevent people, or try to prevent people from putting smokeless powder in their muzzleloader. Have a little disclaimer here about reading the warnings and the instruction manual, which is something you always wanna do, especially when you're new to muzzleloaders. And we have the identification for this particular muzzleloader model. So we have Plains Rifle, 50 caliber. So this is so that, you know, if my grandson or somebody who buys this, you know, from me down the road uh, is wondering what caliber it is, they can look it up online. Oh yeah, this is an Invest Arms Plains Rifle 50 caliber. And they know that they can find 50 caliber balls, 50 caliber, you know, sized patches and things and start shooting with that basic information. They don't need to be able to find necessarily the manual, but they can use this information to find the manual down the road. So don't be disgruntled if you see that in there. We're gonna darken this barrel quite a bit and that writing is just about gonna disappear in color. It's still gonna be there physically, but it's not gonna be nearly as noticeable as it is now. Kind of hidden, not on purpose. <laughs> kind of tucked away in some of the cardboard here, we have our little bag of hardware for the kit. Ooh, almost had one little, little buddy get away there. I'm going to set this aside real quick and we're going to remove the cardboard from the bench just so we can get a better look at some of these parts and pieces. But before we do that, I'm going to check and make sure there's no hardware hidden that may have been jostled around in transport. Sometimes it can be difficult to replace some of these parts or find or figure out which one you're missing. So it's always good just to double check. Okay. And I'm actually going to be holding onto this box for a little while until the kit is complete, just so I have a place to store things here in the shop. I know I can keep it all contained, the box is identified, so I know what the parts inside this box are. Sometimes you start a project and then you go and do something else and then you come back and you're like, what is this? And you, you kind of forget. <laughs> so we have our bag of hardware here and I wanna talk about one of my first kind of kit building tips or tricks. And that is the advantage of a nice 
plastic parts bin. You can pick these up at like Harbor Freight or Menards or a hardware store or something. They're really nice to have just a few of these sitting around your bench for a project like this. This keeps all of your hardware kind of contained and, uh, and in one spot, makes it harder to lose this stuff. So on my bench with my different projects, like I have one here of a powder horn that I'm working on. I have a bunch of powder horn parts and pieces in there. Okay, so I don't think that we lost <laughs> anything in that accidental parts dump, but um, we're going to go through off camera and make sure. So that's uh, that really just kind of proves my point on uh, the advantages of a parts bin like this when you're building a kit. Um, these bags get a little beat up in, in transfer, and I think one of the first things you want to do is dump it out into a parts bin like this. You can see everything. It's uh, hard to lose. I mean, you can still obviously dump this, but uh, you can just kind of set it aside like that and, uh, and keep track of everything. Now, I keep a few of these kind of plastic baggies like this in these bins just for when I'm working on things. So if I'm trying to keep something separate or like if when I finish these tenon plates, I don't want them, gonna, I don't want them to get dinged up or anything, I'll toss them in this bag and put them in this bin. Uh, that's just something to keep in mind. You'll get some of these when you order stuff just in modern day and uh, holding on to a few of them, reusing them. It's a good way to recycle and they're really handy in the shop. So a little bit of a closer look here at our parts bin. We have our four barrel wedge or barrel tenon plates. We have our two wedges, which is good. We have our flint here. Kind of a neat little translucent flint. I'm gonna have to look up and see what uh, what material they're using there. We have our thin piece of leather for to we have our thin piece of leather here to hold on to the flint. We have a cleaning jag to attach to our ramrod. Assorted screws and things here. We have our uh, our tang bolt that'll go through our barrel tang down into our trigger plate to kind of hold the whole thing together. Really important piece, um, but if you lose this, you can replace it I think pretty easily by kind of modifying a hardware store bolt. Uh, like I said, our assorted screws. And I think the thing that I'm probably the most excited about with this kit and just kind of continuing a little bit of a step up when it comes to these Hawken kits um, that we're seeing here with Invest Arms, we have a metal sight system. So some of the cheaper kits out there will have a plastic front and rear sight, which I haven't had any issues with in terms of durability. I think it's purely aesthetics. Uh, for a lot of muzzleloaders out there, I mean, if we're building old muzzleloaders, we like things to be kind of hardy and durable, uh, but also look the part too. And seeing metal sights here with this Invest Arms kit is really nice. We kind of have our old school buckhorn rear sight, which I'm really happy to see on this kit. And we have our kind of hard, <laughs> really thick wedge front sight, pretty thick compared to some of them that I've seen, but we can always take that down if we need to. You'll see here, just like with the trigger guard um, and some of the other metal hardware that we talked about on the stock, this is all pretty rough. So when we get into our metal finishing stage, we'll go through and clean all this up and get a nice even sanded and filed finish so then we can color it uh, the way that we would like uh, moving, moving along here. That's a nice, that's a nice little sight. Very pleased with that Invest Arms. Good job. So I'm going to set these on kind of my table across from my bench here so we don't dump it again. Um, don't beat yourself up. You're going to dump it. Um, it helps to have kind of a clear bench space as you're doing this. There you can see kind of the major parts and pieces all laid out here on the bench. A lot of work ahead of us here, but I'm really excited about getting back into the shop and getting some hand tools out to start assembling this kit. So we've gone over the parts a little bit here, and I want to talk a little bit about the planning process for building a kit like this. Now you can just as easily kind of go into the kit and, uh, and just kind of barrel through it, following the instructions and things. But like I said earlier on, it's good to plan kind of your process with all of this. And it's easy to do with these kits, you know, because it is a process, you can kind of start that thinking going forward. Uh, but aside from the tools in your workspace and kind of the, the materials that you need for a kit like this, I always like to think about an original piece that I can kind of base this kit on or work to be inspired by when I'm assembling these kits. For some of my previous kits, I've gone for just kind of a generically aged 
finish on it, just kind of a generic mountain man look uh, or generic muzzleloader look. But for this one, I'm actually gonna try to recreate as best as I can one of the famous kind of Hawken muzzleloaders that we still have today, and that is the Hawken of Liver Eating Johnson. Now, I'll let you go and, and research Liver Eating Johnson on your own. It's, it's a little too much to get into for this build series, but it's kind of an iconic hawk and muzzleloader that we're able to look at and still see today. And there's, there's tons of copies of it, it being an iconic muzzleloader, but that's not gonna dissuade me, I think, from kind of building some influence from that original piece into this kit muzzleloader. So you can see in the picture here, there's a lot of wear and tear on this muzzleloader that we're gonna be replicating a little bit artificially, but uh, we're gonna go through and talk about those chemical processes and those finishes and things as we go through the kit building process. But I think it's really nice to have kind of a, a goal in mind as you're building that you can kind of work towards. And I think it helps to print off a picture and hang it or put it next to your workbench so that as you're working on your kit, you can see that and see your inspiration and kind of see what you have now and what you're going for. And I find that that helps connect those dots in the build process. Now, that's not something you have to do by any means. Uh, you can put this together probably in a weekend if you if you wake up early and stay up late. But uh, I like to really get into the tr traditional craft and uh, kind of try to bring some influences that I see from contemporary long rifle and muzzleloading masters into kind of a, a mass produced kit, which you don't see a whole lot of, but I think it's nice to try to take some of those learnings and apply them to a cheaper kit, especially if you're interested in muzzleloader building. So that's what I'm gonna be working towards when it comes to this muzzleloader kit process. There's a ton of other original Hawkins still out there that you can check out. I'll have some links in the description of this video to some resources if you're still planning and at ilovemuzzleloading.com with the article that goes along with this video for you to check out. Like I said, you don't have to do this, but I think, you know, instead of scrolling through your phone mindlessly in the evening, you can look up some original Hawkins, some original muzzleloaders to be inspired by, and it really adds quite a bit to the kit and the story that you're adding to your muzzleloader and then later on for future generations, you know, your muzzleloading story that you're passing down to hopefully your grandkids or maybe, you know, some of the neighbor kids that are interested in muzzleloading. That's all I have for you for this first part, this first official part of this Invest Arms Gemmer Hawken build process. I'm excited to continue on to the next part where we'll be talking about the tools that I recommend, the tools that I have here in the shop that I'll be using on this kit. It's not going to be a totally comprehensive look at all the tools because as we build, I'm sure something else will come up where a tool will come up that we're like, hey, you know, this would be pretty useful to add in here. But I'm just going to be a general overview of what you can get to get started. We'll be talking about all of that in the next video. And until next time, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching and thank you muzzleloaders.com for, uh, for getting me this kid in. Really appreciate it and I'm excited to be sharing this with you. Thanks so much and we'll catch you next time.